You better say your prayers, you flea-bitten varmint. I'm gonna blow you to smithereenies. You do that and I'll kill you. Welcome to another exciting evening of Bullshitting with Bob right here on Brutal Metal Radio. But tonight it's just not Bullshitting with Bob. It's gonna be Bullshitting with Bob and Buffy. And we're talking to Kelly Garney, co-founder and original basis of Quiet Riot and current basis for the Godmother of Soul. How you doing tonight, Kelly? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, Bobby? Yeah, I'm Buffy. Hi, Kelly. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How's the weather at home? Yeah, uh, good. Cool. Really? It's really nice here in Bama. Uh, I don't know about nice. It's, it's, it's quite nice here. Hey, it's pretty humid out this way, man. You walk outside, you should take a sweat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I stick to the desert. I like the weather out here. Now, just to let everybody out there in listener land know, Buffy and Kelly go back, what, Kelly, about 32, 33 years, something like that? Yeah, quite a long time. Yes, it has uh, been. Yeah, it's, it's more years than I can count. Yeah. <laughs> more years than I thought I'd live through, bro. <laughs> 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 now uh, we were talking uh, before the break and or before we came in and uh, about you know you jamming with the Godmother of Soul and this is the widow of James Brown, correct? Yeah, yeah. She um, was married to him. Oh, I think it was sixteen years, and for pretty much all that time, uh, she was on the road with him. She toured with him worldwide for, for sixteen years. That was how they met. Originally hired uh, to be a uh, backup singer. She was working as, uh, I believe, either a bartender or a cocktail waitress at the Rainbow in Hollywood on Sunset. And James Brown came in and took a liking to her, and she wanted a singing gig, so they were talking, and next thing you know, she was on the road with him, and eventually ended up uh, married to him. Wow. And, yeah, so she, she really learned her how to sing that soul stuff. I mean, like, really good for a white broad. I mean, she can just really get down with it. And uh, she's one of the best girl singers I've ever heard in my life. I, I got to wow. tell you. I tell you, yeah. um, when I was stationed at Fort Gordon, and uh, I've got a friend of mine that's in the chat room named John, uh, he was stationed there as well, and we weren't there at the same time, though. But every weekend, man, you know, we get to, get to go on leave. This is in Augusta, Georgia, where James Brown was living. Mm -hmm. right. Every Sunday, dude, you would see something about him getting picked up for drunk driving or, or talking shit to a cop. <laughs> every yeah. fucking yeah. weekend, man, it was great. Well, he was a handful for her. I mean, the guy is, you know, Godfather of Soul aside, you know, I mean, he was a hell reason more than anything. He, um, you know, he's just wild and crazy, just like uh, a lot of us can be or would be if we could get away with it. I guess when you're in <laughs> He was that yeah. way his whole life, though, and you got to respect that. He never changed. Yeah. No, he lived he James yeah. Brown, you know. Well, individuality is really the biggest favor any of us can do to ourselves. And for some of us, it can lead to our end. Uh, but, you know, James just lived the way he wanted to live and did what he wanted to do. Figured he had earned it, and in my book, he did. Uh, he never hurt anybody. You know, he just raised some hell, and nothing wrong with that. Nope. nope. That's what we all do when we can. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You we know, just slow down as the years go. Yeah. We can't set so many <laughs> fires as quick. <laughs> no, I can't. No, I, I've, I've heard a lot of stories from, from my singer, Tommy Ray Brown, and, uh, just, just incredible, but there's actually uh, sort of a positive fallout from it. Um, well, first of all, she's not as thin as she was when she was in James Brown's band, and so a lot of her clothes fit me. Oh, and, uh, So I've been getting like all these really great stage clothes that she had made up from back in the day, and it goes right along with, with the theme of our band, because we're more of a 60s, 70s kind of a thing. And uh, so it's all like bell bottoms and, you know, just, just that whole kind of a look. So I got, she kind of dresses me up for stage and it's great. You know, I got all these clothes and then, as it turns out, I wear the same size shoes as James Brown. So awesome. day, we, we did a video shoot. I was actually wearing James Brown's cowboy boots. Oh, dude. Wow. Yeah. 
Uh, how yeah. cool is that? I mean, that, that's that's history right there, bro. Oh, wow. I know. Lots of history. You know, and, and, and actually, uh, we were doing a green screen thing, and so you have to, like, stand in front of it and move around to music, and you're, like, all by yourself. You feel like you're naked, because there's, like, these people watching you. It's you, just your bandmates and trying to do the video. But you're, you're there by yourself. You have to play the music. You have to do all the stage moves and everything. And, um... You know, but I did really well, and I said, if I'm going to wear these boots, I better fill them. So I, I actually ended up doing really well, and I give full credit to the boots. The boots were magical. Yep, they were magic boots. You got a little bit of that soul, man. That was awesome. Yeah. Now, let's um let's trickle back in history a little bit. Okay. Um, Everybody, of course, it's, it's well known that who your best friend was and who you grew up with and jammed with, and that person would be Randy Rhodes. That's correct, yeah. Now, how old were you uh, when you guys met? How did we meet? No, uh, how old uh, were you? Oh, uh, we were about 11. Oh. So, y'all yeah. were doing the bike riding and, you know, the window breaking, stick ball, and that kind of <laughs> stuff, right? Uh, yeah, you might say that. No, we were just kids, but, um, it was, it was um, you know, when, when we went right into seventh grade out of uh, elementary school. So we were in a bigger school with bigger kids, and it was, you know, very scary, as it would be for any kid, you know, first day and all that. And the way I met Randy was I, I didn't really fit into anything that was going on in this new school, and neither did he. And there, there was, I think there was 1,200 kids in the school or something. Somebody told me, and I thought it sounded uh, like way too many, but apparently there were like 1,200 kids in the school. And um, I didn't fit into anything. I wasn't into sports. I wasn't academic at all. Um, nothing about school interested me. And I saw this kid who dressed a little bit different and wore his hair different. He just was different in every single way. It was almost like he had an aura around him. He just something about him just screamed, "I'm not the same." And I was very attracted to that. I thought that was kind of cool. I mean, to, to me, it was just just blaringly obvious. So I one day I just went up to him and started talking, and um, that was how we met. And I guess uh, some would say I made the right call because uh, he went on to become, you know, very big, very legendary. And um, he uh, obviously showed that he wasn't just fooling around with this being different thing. It was actually true. And, and it was that different, that true difference that I think his talent uh, existed inside of him. That's what made him different. And I saw that. I just hadn't recognized exactly what it was yet. And, of course, I began to learn once I knew him very well. Now, uh, Buffy told me a story one time mm -hmm. that, um, you know, back in the Code 4 days, which we'll get to shortly, that um, you brought a box out that uh, had a pair of dolls in it. I bought a what house? No, it was, you, had a, you had a box that had a pair of dolls, one that you made of Randy and one that Randy made of you. And you showed it. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was, actually, uh, they were both, the, both of them were, were of me. One was a cloth doll that had been uh, made uh, of me by a fan in Japan. And uh, the other was a statue that Randy made of me out of clay uh, when he had made it when he was about 13 years old. Oh, wow. And do you still have these? Uh, well, uh, yes and no, I do, but uh, they're just not around me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Um, That's cool, though. Now, tell us, you know, you, you guys started learning music about the same time, and uh, did Mr. Loris teach both of y'all? Uh, well, we simply learned quite a bit off of Mrs. Rhodes. So with her having a, a music school, that was... Uh, in their in their household, uh, the music school was the, sort of the centerpiece of all activity. Everything in the household revolved around school, and Randy and his his brother and his sister Kathy and uh, Kelly Rhodes, um, they had grown up. All three of them had grown up in this music school. So uh, Friday nights, every 
Friday night, it was mandatory you went to the music school. And since I'm hanging with my buddy, you know, I go to the music school too. And, and it wasn't just about, a, about maybe two or three weeks where I said to Randy, I said, I'd really like to play something. And he suggested I play bass. And so we, we actually we ended up stealing my first bass. And um, he started teaching me. What, what he was learning, he was still learning lessons at the time. He was just learning his leads. So he'd come home from a lesson, learn his, uh, after learning his leads, he'd teach me a little pattern to play behind his leads, and then I'd just do that over and over while he practiced his leads and learned them and changed them to his own taste. And that was how I learned, and that was how we learned. And, of course, we went on later to refine it into a band situation, but, but in the very beginning, uh, the school, the role it played with us was, so I was the bass player now, Mrs. Rhodes had a, um, a little band that she had herself that was comprised of, of a horn section, and they, they had a drummer and a keyboard player, wow. a piano player, uh, but for guitar and bass, it, she elected me and Randy, we really didn't have a choice, but it was old really old music to us, and we hated doing it, because it was like Benny Goodman, and, you know, Chad and the Shoeshine Boy, this old, old brass stuff, mostly. It was mostly a, um, uh, a horn band. Oh, okay. And all the guys that played them were big nerds, and, and we had, you know, nothing in common with them. More, more of like we, your late 40s kind of, of music? music? No, actually, they were like in their 20s, but they were like total geeks, never been laid in their life, or, you know, <laughs> white short sleeve, every single one of them wore white sleeve, short sleeve shirts with a tie, they all had goofy glasses, they all had really short hair, and that was like the last thing we wanted to be, and we were getting further away from that look every day, and um, so that was one of the reasons we didn't like playing in the band. But I, I do have to say, years and years later, I'm really glad she made us do it because it gave us a very, very well-rounded musical education, which was uh, very, very, very utmost in, in her plans for me and Randy. She wanted us to be taught and to learn things that would make us uh, the kind of musicians who could walk into virtually any situation and actually pull it off. And I got to say, all these years later, it stuck, and I played with any kind of band you can imagine, and everything she taught me still works. Man, that is outstanding. And that, yeah. is a, that is a great story, and I appreciate you sharing that. Not a problem. Now, um, going you know into your band stage, uh, you guys developed into uh, the Cats and Jammer Kids. Yeah, Cats and Jammer Kids was, actually it was a band that had no singer. It was uh, me and Randy, and we had a drummer whose name was Bill, but we called him Rubberhead because he had kind of a, a funny face. <laughs> and, uh, I know I'm going to get sued for that one of these days. <laughs> Probably from my book, because I tell the same thing in there, and I, I think I do put his last name. So I have no fear, I can edit it out. <laughs> uh, I, no, I didn't say his last name. Uh, I can get away there you go. But, um, this is for entertainment yeah. purposes yeah. only. <laughs> uh, yeah, Cats and Jammer was just the three of us, and um, we played a mixture of Alice Cooper songs, some David Bowie songs, um, and then some just little songs that me and Randy had written that really weren't songs, they were more jams, but they were our patterns and stuff like that. Some of those songs actually ended up becoming eventually Quiet Riot songs. Uh, those original jams from way back then. Wow. And, yeah, so um, that's all Cats and Jammer Kids was to us. It, it really only lasted maybe seven, eight months before we went somewhere else and Rubberhead went somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, this developed into what became Quiet Riot. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. There were there was a number of other bands that me and Randy played in um, prior to Quiet Riot. And uh, there was uh, at least four. And, uh, and we jammed with anybody we could. Anybody that wanted two guys to walk in there and jam, we'd jam. We'd play anywhere, anytime. Um, once we got Mobile and had a car for his girlfriend that he got, she had a car, we, we could actually just drop in at places and jam, and we used to do that all the time. 
now I'm going to ask you a little off the wall question here. What kind of trouble did you two get into, you know, being teenagers out in uh, out in L.A.? Spill the beans. <laughs> well, I got a whole book of that stuff coming, but right on. If, you, if, if I can give the general idea, I mean, the, the main thing we, we got in trouble for was we refused to go to school. We, we preferred to stay at home and practice our instruments, and because all, all of our parents were at work, so we could do whatever we wanted. We just cut, and we get in trouble for it, and, and we get admonished and told to, are going to school whether we like it or not still we wouldn't go <laughs> yeah. you know that that would uh, oftentimes you know if for some reason we decided we got a better offer than sitting around practicing like some maybe an older guy said hey let's go to Hollywood or something we do that because as far as we were concerned that was that was part of the whole music thing because if we went to Hollywood we could uh, go to Guitar Center and we could look at their bulletin board and look for a singer. We were always looking for a singer. And uh, in several cases, when we, we couldn't find one, we made them out of somebody that looked like a singer that had no aspirations of ever being a singer. So we, we turned them into singers. That happened several times. Uh, as far as trouble, well, sometimes we get picked up by the cops for this truancy thing. Um, <laughs> one time we were with an older guy and he had like pornos and a switchblade in his car. <laughs> and that that. You know, we don't know nothing about no pornos in the car. And, and so, you know, it's just really quite innocent stuff like that. It wasn't uh, assaults and batteries, although we did get arrested for that one time. Uh, but we we didn't look at it as a salt battery. There's, there's a street in Hollywood called Selma, and it's it's a very famous street in that it's it's well known, and probably still this goes on. I haven't been there in years, so I don't know. And if I do go to Hollywood, I'm probably not going to go to the street. But it was it was famous for having male hustlers on it, and so you go down there, and just all over the street there'd be these these guys. Uh, that were basically male prostitutes and there'd be like all these old men down there pulling over and picking them up and we thought it was a little bit disgusting yeah, a I, lot of bit disgusting <laughs> yeah so <laughs> there was a bunch of us piled into a car and we had been drinking we had a bunch of beer and so we were just driving down the street chuck, chucking beer bottles with all these people these guys <laughs> And they were jumping behind bushes and behind bus benches. It was pretty funny, you know, but we failed to notice the LAPD car right behind us following <laughs> the whole way. You know, watch, just watching us. They didn't even pull us over there. They, probably, they waited until we got up on the Hollywood Boulevard and then they pulled us over there. And everybody got handcuffed and faced down on the sidewalk. People thought they were filming a movie. It was great. Now, the now, the strip back then was pretty crazy, wasn't it? The strip, Sunset Strip. Oh, oh yeah, it was no place for a little kid, definitely. <laughs> but that made it that made it all more attractive to us. And oh yeah, I, I, I would I would feel it's very safe to say that kids haven't changed much. So uh, they know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it was a bad place for a kid. I mean, you know, we're we're twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and we're doing this. You know. <laughs> now, um, once Quiet Riot started up, um, of course you got. Kevin DeBro, and um, how did you stumble across him? Or did he stumble uh, across y'all? Well, I'll, I'll just give you the short version. Okay. Uh, there were actually two versions. Um, Kevin's is the shortest because he simply says that we gave him a call, which we did, and uh, we went over to his house, which we did, and Randy brought his guitar in, which he didn't, and his guitar, which he also didn't, because we never did that. And wow. Randy played for him, and he was so bowled over that, you know, there, right then and there, the band was formed. And, that, and Kevin always left it at that. And we, we had a, not a argument, but a disagreement over this, because I had said all that, my version, in a magazine, and he said, no, 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 this is what happened. And I said, no, that didn't happen at all, Kev, this is the way it went down. But what, what happened basically was, well, I overheard telephone conversations. 
wanted you to do with him, and he was very persistent with a lot of phone calls. We finally <laughs> gave in, and we worked with him on his singing, and pretty soon he was passable, although personally I was never happy. But I will say this, Kevin did learn how to sing. He proved that to the world. It yes, took him a long time, but he proved it, and, and he, was a, he was a great singer, but he sure wasn't when I was with him. <laughs> 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 and as you mentioned that uh, for a teaser, I have uh, two early Quiet Riot songs featuring Kelly on bass that I will play later on in the broadcast. Yeah, I think one of them is uh, Quinn the Eskimo, which, which was a song that we were in the process of recording our first album, I believe, and that was one of the songs that was on the list to, to go on the album, and it actually did end up getting recorded, and I could never figure out why. In fact, till this, to this day, I don't know why we did that song. I think that song's horrible. <laughs> it's stupid. It's dumb. It wasn't even originally done by anybody I consider cool. And I just thought it was a really idiotic song about an Eskimo. You know? and so, yeah, how does that fit in anything, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not a fan of that. But, you know, I was there playing so we played it. And, and you know, that's why the only reason Well, you know, if you if you go to Venice Beach, you're more than likely to find two, maybe even three Eskimos, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I never could figure out what the song was even about. Uh, I, I know there's something about tea in it, and I, I just never got it. So it just wasn't our style, and and that was that that song's a perfect example of what was happening to us at that time, which I'll get into later when we, when we get to that point. Uh, but, but a lot of the reasons we were doing that song was because we were pushed into it by our management to do music like that, and the music clearly isn't who me and Randy were. And Kevin actually liked the song, so he was fine with it, and our drummer didn't care then and doesn't care now, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, from what I've read, you guys were tearing up the strip pretty good on a regular basis, right? Yeah, mostly I did it, but yeah, I had help occasionally. <laughs> now, um, you guys played like the whiskey and the rainbow. Uh, what oh, are some I of the? Yeah, I had a, I had three other guys help me do that. Um, yeah, we were at all the all the good places: the Troubadour, whiskey. Starwood was mostly our um, our home base eventually. The Rainbow back in those days, uh, you actually had to be somebody. Um, basically, the the thing with the Rainbow was if you don't have a record deal, you're not going to play the Rainbow. And we did, we never did. I believe Quiet Riot eventually did without me. Um, but what we had as far as a record deal by Hollywood standards wasn't really even considered a record deal since you couldn't go and buy the album anywhere. You had to get on a boat or a plane and go to Japan, then you could buy our album. Right. Uh, or it's closer, closer, you could go to Malaysia or Vietnam or Korea or any other places that they were sold. Uh, everywhere except here. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was a kid, you know, I tell the story quite a bit. Um, I hung out at this uh, record store and, you know, they sold stereos and stuff like that there, too, called New Generation. And, man, the, uh, the guy that, that did the records there were pretty good friends, and he had a pretty good import section. And I ran across, this is before I ever even heard of Quiet Riot, was uh, they had one and two there. And then, you know, of course, they broke, and uh, I went back to get those two, and they, they weren't there. Yeah, they, they did get, uh, when they were for sale over here, people did buy them. Uh, they must have all lived in California, because that was pretty much the only place we played. Uh, but we did have radio play, and uh, God knows where that went, but um, uh, they, they actually, the albums did sell. I mean, nobody got rich, you know, and, you know, I'm still not getting rich off of them. I 
never really got any money from them. In fact, uh, Quiet Riot is, was, I mean, basically the whole tenure with them uh, was not about making money. You, you didn't make money. You never expected to make money. It wasn't even, you know, a Learning you had. I was paying the dues. Yeah, that's what we thought we were doing. So, um, but I mean, now everything got straightened out with, with lawyers, ASCAP, EMI, all these places that pay you. And plus that out, the albums have been shuffled around to different labels. And now they're on for Rhino. I'm, or there's a compilation album that's on Rhino. And I do get royalty checks from that. But uh, quite honestly, I'm not getting rich. Uh, I get them quarterly every three months. And generally, I get a check for about five dollars. Wow. <laughs> Here's your pack of smokes. Have a good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, what were some of the other bands that were out, you know, jamming these stages by the same time y'all were? Like, was Van Halen, you know, hitting about this time? Yeah, Van Halen, uh, they dominated a club called Gazaris, which was more of a college crowd. And, uh, more of an upscale crowd than your average Sunset Strip, um, you know, street rockers. Those, those are the kind of people that used to come and see us. And a number of other bands as well. And I'm talking like um, Wolfgang, which later on became Autograph, who had a huge hit with Turn Up the Radio. And uh, there was a band called Sister, which went on to become Wasp with Blackie Lawless. And, and they have a ton of songs. Um, so there were other guys out there doing the, the, you know, the hard rock grind kind of a thing. It's just that the club owners uh, in Hollywood at that time didn't feel that there was any market for it. Uh, but all they had to do was walk into the Starwood any night, and they'd see the place was always standing room only, and, um, you know, it was always packed with people who actually did want to hear that music. But trying and sell it to a record label or a good club like somewhere like the Rainbow or whatever, they didn't want any part of it. Now, were there any nights, I'm sure there were, that, um, you know, uh, maybe one of the band members got a, a little tipsy and maybe fell off stage or, <laughs> you know, something to that effect? Oh, you mean Kelly Garney. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't point any fingers, Kelly. <laughs> well, You guys were together for uh, As Quiet Riot for how many years? Uh, I was in it for four. For four? Uh-huh. And toward the end, you know, things kind of, you know, went sour. And uh, if you want to county code it. And eventually y'all split up. Yeah. Well, I, no, I well say actually, that. it was, I, I got kicked out, which pretty much I had set the bar for getting kicked out of bands with my actions. Um, I get so much heat for it. I, I can't believe somebody hasn't done something worse than me to get kicked out of a band, but apparently I'm, I'm the king of that. So, wow. um, but yeah, I was asked to leave the band, which I gladly did because I, I got tired of it. The, the no money thing, I was working on a full-time job. I was the only one in the band with a job other than Randy teaching. Technically, that was a job, but um, I was the only one who actually had to, to work because I was the only one, also the only one in the band who didn't live at home. I lived on my own. Kevin eventually moved out, um, but um, that wasn't quite a while. So, uh, yeah, I was 
and um, we're not going to discuss the uh, replacement bass player at all. Rudy, I, you know, I don't have a problem with Rudy. I don't. Uh, he's been real cool with me. I've never had any bad blood with him. Him, him and Kevin um, obviously had problems, but for there to be an issue that I had to be involved with, I, I would fight with Kevin just because he was my friend and no other reason. Uh, but Rudy, you know, has proved himself. Uh, guy's been in more bands than I certainly have. And, um, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a nice guy. Uh, I will say this, I don't know him very well. I've had only a couple of conversations with him. I've met him uh, probably 10 or 12 times. And that's pretty much it. Other than that, I'm, I'm really not tight with Ernie, but I, I do know that um, he never says anything bad about me. And so I won't say anything bad about him. Right on. And pretty much, we play nice in the sandbox together that way. That's awesome that you know you guys are on, on that kind of level with each other. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's more professional that way too. I mean, you know, there's things he, he's done or said or played more than anything, you know, that I can go off on and say, well, I'm, and then really it's more more of a thing where well, I would have done it different, you know. Yeah, but you don't want, you don't really want to hang on to the negative, you know. You want to stay positive and move forward, not look right, back, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I wish him the best of luck. He does great. You know, um, he, he does his job real well. He's very professional. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of enemies in the music business. And, and that's all good stuff. And I applaud him for that because it's very easy to make enemies in the music business. Trust me, I know quite well. And speaking on that, um, you and Kevin remain friends for years. Well, actually, sort of. Um, in, when I was in Quiet Riot, most of the problems that I had, uh, well, let's just say the root of my unhappiness in that band, which did lead to drinking, although that probably would have happened anyway, with or without Kevin, but um, I like to say he drove me to drink. Uh, <laughs> I, I hated him. I hated his guts. I couldn't stand the look at him. I couldn't stand being in the same room with him. Uh, I hate being in a band with him. I thought he was horrible. I thought he was the worst thing that had ever happened to me and Randy. I, I had absolutely nothing in the world good to say about Kevin, with the exception that he was a fairly good businessman at times. And um, so even after I left the band, I continued to hate him. And, I, you know, he went on to, you know, forge his own success out there. And I was still mildly interested in the music business. So I picked up a circus magazine or something like that, hit parader, you know, and here's Kevin splashed all over the cover and he's got a fold out. Here's a picture of him with his new Corvette, you know. And the whole time I'm thinking, all right, next time he comes to town, I'll get a bow and arrow and I'll sneak it into the theater and I'll be, you know, way in the back. I'll get really good with this bow and arrow and I'll put an arrow right through his head, you know. <laughs> And I, I liked him immediately, and, and it was true what our mutual 
wonderful friend had said about all the shared history, you know, that became a really good bonding agent for me and Kevin to sort of re reconnect with, with whatever we had at the beginning, which was not anything like friendship, but certainly in the course of being in a band, there is a certain brotherhood. Yeah, a kindred spirit. Uh, yeah, a certain sense of family. You may, you may hate the guy, but he, hey, he's like in your family, he's like your brother. And so we did have at least that. And and building upon that, you know, with, with him changed and me a different person, um, uh, he, you know, really was able to get himself into my heart and he occupied just as big a space as Randy did. Because I really hadn't known anybody as long as I knew Kevin. And, and losing him was every bit as painful as it was to lose Randy. Oh, I'm sure, man. I am sure of that. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I have a real brother, and he's great, fantastic. But my real brothers were Randy and Kevin, and I don't have either. I, and there's nobody else I can say that about. Now, speaking about, you know, Randy, before we, we tie up that section and move on to the next, um, I want to jump on my soapbox real quick, like I, we okay. spoke about before. Now, um, like I was saying, you know, prior to Buffy introducing us and, uh, you know, getting to know you and everything, I was on randyrose.tk. I'm going to throw the link out there, so if y'all want to send hate mail, you know, that's on you. Um, <laughs> but, send it to me, trust me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely get blamed. Um, yeah. But I, I, I was reading all these fucking posts on there, man, and, you know, they were bagging on you. You know, you're keeping your, your best friend's memory alive. You know, you put on, you go to the memorial every year at the cemetery, and, you know, he was your friend from, like you said, 10, 11 years old. These people don't know the fucking history that you got. They just know, you know, what he became, and they want to say that you're trying to take make a buck off of his name, and that really fucking pisses me off. And if you're out there listening in Radio Land, fuck you. Yeah, because I never say it in an email. Fuck you too. <laughs> <laughs> now, after Quiet Riot, I don't even bother fighting with them. I don't. They don't bother me. I don't care. I used to respond to them. And then I learned that the best way to respond to it was simply for them, and they go away. They'll talk bad, they'll get on there, and a bunch of them will be together, and they'll start, you know, trashing me. And, and, and I, I used to jump into the whole phrase and say, yeah, well, you know, who are you, and fuck you, and you don't know what you're talking about, and, and that guy over there's a liar, and, you know, and I, uh, all I did was make the problem worse. So finally I just said, you know what, I'm not going to even let it get to me. And I've done that for the past couple of years, and my life is a whole lot, much improved by doing that. Yeah, yeah. keep all that stress out of it. Put them in the rearview mirror, yeah. brother, and keep on trucking. Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing anybody in the, any of the businesses that I'm in, which is art, writing, and music, um, the last thing I should, I should worry about or anybody that's doing any kind of a public consumption kind of um, endeavor is worry about what other people say to you. Don't, don't worry about it. Fuck them. You know, they're, it's just like they say about opinions, you know, everybody's got one. Yep. Well, they're not going to yeah. say it either way, whether you like it or not. Right, yeah, and if people got an issue with me, I don't care. You know, I don't care. Uh, it's just little people that, are, that have that jealousy factor that wish they were in the position you were. And that's all it is. Well, that's what I'm told. So, you see, I've asked a lot of people, I say, just what is it that I do so bad that these people hate, you know? And people more wise than them um, have a good answer in that they say, well, they're, they're jealous of you. And but unfortunately, that answer doesn't really cut it for me because I'm thinking, jealous of what? <laughs> you know, I mean, it wasn't that wonderful of an experience being in Quiet Riot by any means. It was hard, it was tough, It was it, you had no money. The, the only benefits you got was everywhere you go, you, you got free booze, which in my case was a bad thing. And <laughs> you just kind of fuel the fire, right? <laughs> you had to fuel the fire, and, you know, and, and um, we, we had a... You know, just some very aggressive and, and very grueling uh, rehearsal schedule. And so it was not fun. And, you know, everybody thinks that, that I got this, you know, this, this great life that um, I had with, with them, but it wasn't, it was not fun. Well, that's you had it. your benefits. You know, if you were into the drug thing, there was plenty of that around for free. We weren't that 
bedroom door, there's a line of girls. Okay, it's all great. You just pick one. That's your pay. Right. You know? I think their largest misconception is that they think being in the music business is an easy thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's an all easy. easy and party and fun, and really it's a it, lot of hard work and grueling yeah, hours. It's not all caviar and it, fucking champagne no, Don Pignon or, yeah. or Don Pignon, how you pronounce that? You're doing great, you know, so, I mean, and everything's relative, you know, the bigger a band you are, the bigger you are problems, you know, but, but getting back to these, these Kelly Gardy big monitors here, um, one thing that's become very clear to me over the years is that Randy has a very uh, different fan base. His fan base is, is made up of people who are very loyal, and there are some of them out there that I just adore. They're so great. They say the best things. They, talk, they want to talk about Randy. They ask the right questions. You know, and, the, and uh, the thing I really like about them is they don't call me or, you know, email me with something and say, well, you're an asshole because you said this. Uh, but there are people who do. And, and they're a very sensitive bunch. And they are very protective of Randy. So anything they see as a threat, even me, you know, I'm going to get, you know, pissed on for it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, for a while, I used to visit all those sites
it's just, I don't know, man, people need to get a life, you know? They do need to get a life, really, because, I mean, people that are, were close to both me and Randy tell, say a different thing. They say, you should sell it, you deserve it, you earn it. You know, I lived for years with no money. I lived for years of, you know, getting chicks I meet backstage to buy me something to eat. Um, you know, I had to do that for years and years and years. I'd make money. Sure. But guess what? I never saw it. It went to everybody else. It went to the light guy, the photographer, the makeup people, the hair people, uh, you know, and the roadies. It went everywhere but in my pocket, by any of our pockets. None of us ever got a fucking dime. Not one dime for being in Quiet Riot. So, so what? I sell my collection, I get some money. Well, you know, that's the reason for everybody to jump on me. I'm making money off of Randy. Wow. Which is ridiculous. I mean, I, I, there's actually a guy that me and Randy grew up with. And he makes his living by bootlegging our first two albums. That's how. That's where all the bootlegs come from. Oh wow! Just one guy. They grew up with us. And guess what? I don't give a fuck. I don't care. He probably makes pretty good money, but I don't care. I'm not going to sit in my garage and bootleg him, but he does, and I don't care. The Rose family doesn't care. Drew Forsyth doesn't care. None of us care. Well, you know, on the, on the other side of it, though, you know, thanks to that guy for putting it out there where we can get it. <laughs> well, that's the way I look at it, you know. <laughs> People do want these, these, this music, and, uh, and he provides a, a, a public service, you know, really. As far as I'm <laughs> In a way, he does. Us. And I see, you know, these big bands, you know, going, oh, everybody's stealing our music and they're downloading it for free and all that. For one thing, it's unavoidable. There's no way you can get out of it. Originally, with Lars or somebody from Metallica tried to fight it. You know, always from the very beginning, I saw it as sort of a demise of, of the um, traditional record company. Um, pretty much everybody can have a record company right now and it just exists online you know here's a sample listen to it if you want it buy it we'll send you a cd that we make in our garage <laughs> and, and that's what record companies are now you know, and, and more power to them you know i'm cool with that but but when musicians you know complain about the internet and stuff they use it just as much as anybody you know the, the internet is just one big pimp and Everybody uses it to advertise their bands and all that. Uh, used to, there was a time when a lot of bands would make most of their money off of albums. These days, you have to actually work for your money. You have to actually get out there and play shows. And this is especially true with, with leftovers from the 80s, you know, all, all your bands that have stood the, the test of time, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of, of their breakups and memory changes. And I'm talking like Skid Row and, you know, Warren and, you know, Rat and just bands like that, that that still are around to this day. You know, we're talking 30 years and these guys are still out there plugging away playing. Mm -hmm. So, um, for them, the reality of actually putting out an album and selling it and people buying it doesn't exist. These guys have to get out there, travel from point A to point B, put on a great show, sell some merchandising, get, get your, make sure you get your money up front from the promoter, and there's your pay right there. Don't expect a huge album sales. Don't expect to put a gold record on your wall. It's, you know, it doesn't happen. A lot of... Um, Bigger bands are selling records. That's why there still is record stores. But, you know, I mean, just by the fact that a tower record store that was basically a, a, a landmark and, um, you know, just a major part of the Sunset Strip, Tower Records right. doesn't make it anymore. They closed. Yep. And that was a very big deal. And a lot of record stores have closed. And so there's just no money in it anymore. You gotta go out there and earn it. Do a show. Nope. Make everybody stand, sign autographs, be nice, sell some t shirts. Then you're gonna get a picture. And you know that that is very valid because you know, like you said, the internet today, especially how, you know, all these social media 
uh, sites are up. People can network. Um, you have places like iTunes and Amazon.com. You can put your songs up, you know, one track at a time for 99 cents or a whole album for seven bucks. You know, the the the, the really the the weight that the record labels had back, you know, in the day, you know, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, it's pretty much gone. Yeah, it is. It is. Which, since I never had really great relationships with any of the record companies in that, um, well, most of them didn't want to sign us, and so, um, that's why we got this, this oddball deal out of Japan eventually, but, um, you know, all the big major labels just wouldn't have anything to do with Quiet Riot, you know. So we had to uh, figure it out on our own. And, you know, had we had the internet back in those days, things would have definitely turned out different. But um, we had nothing like that. It was all about you had to have a record, you had to have it in a store, and then MTV hit. Then you had to have a video, too. And these were things that were non-existent when, when I was doing my Quiet Riot stint. Now, from leaving from Quiet Riot to later on, um, once you um, were fired from Quiet Riot, you wanted to become a paramedic. Yeah, when, when I left Quiet Riot, I wanted uh, a new life that was completely different than the one I had known, and that which was the music business. I'd grown up in it, um, then grown old in it, and um, I just wanted to get as far away from that as I could, so when I was uh, kicked out of the band. I um, three days later, I cut off all my hair and enrolled in a paramedic school and graduated and went to work the day after I graduated and ended up working for a total of ten years. Wow! And what, what what was that like? Pretty much like being in a rock band. Uh, sometimes you'd have a partner, they'd give you a partner and you hated them. So there was my Kevin. And you'd be going to work uh, with a car wreck and there'd be all these people on the sidewalk watching you work in the middle of the street. Yeah. There was my stage and my performance. And backstage was the inside of my ambulance. And then I went to the hospital and dropped off my patient. There was all these hot nurses around. There were my groupies. Wow. Buffy just handed me a little note on the ticker here. She right. wants me to ask you, how many babies have you delivered? Eight. <laughs> there you go. I remember. <laughs> well, you should have piped up then. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted him to say it. You're yeah. part of this, too. <laughs> four, four of them in cars on the side of the freeway. Wow. I bet the the first time I know I would have been shitting bricks if I ever had to do that. I mean, it's scary, yeah. Well, I remember it's really scary. Kelly, back in the day, you'd say it was like being a part time psychiatrist as well. Yeah, well, we had we had a saying saying on the street. You know, we we said that uh, you worked the streets out here for five years. You got a PhD in psychology and psychiatry, and a lot of that job was, uh, you know, knowing the psychology of the person you had to deal with. you got to remember, a lot of your, your your business, your customers, for lack of a better word, uh, they're having the worst day they ever had in their entire life. And you show up, and they look at you, and you're the one that has to fix it. Well, and it's probably what they feel is the worst time of their lives are very fragile because it's an accident situation or something, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, and, you know, it's a tense thing to begin with. It is, and you do 
yourself a huge, huge favor. It's more of a favor to the patient than it is to you. But the first thing you want to do is establish a very, very good rapport with, with anybody in any situation and uh, get them on your side. Right. And, you know, and, and get them, uh, get their trust in you and all that. Make them comfortable. You. you know, but if you're doing, we, we ran a lot of psychiatric calls and, and those are the kind of people that when you show up, pretty much, I don't know how many times I showed up and uh, I had a gun pointed at me or uh, I had a guy with a knife, you know, and it's like, wow. Well, you know, we were there on what they call the 5150 hole, which is a 72 hour psychiatric evaluation. It's basically an arrest. They're going. They don't have a choice. And out in LA, you don't call the cops. They don't want to know about it. As far as they're concerned, this is a medical problem. That's why you're there. And so it's a medical problem. The guys, if you walk into the guy's house, or you kick his door down, which you're allowed to do, and, and he's got a gun. That's a medical problem. And the cops don't want to know nothing about it. Whoa. That's deep. You don't get back up. You don't get anything. You just deal with it. It's and not so, a criminal situation. Yeah, it's not criminal. Wow. So it, then once they shoot you, then it's criminal. Oh, but I got you. To, the, and then, then it's to too late. Shot or shot, at least shot at. And wow. You might, a cop might show up. But, yeah. um, I always dealt with it uh, in my own special way. Um people thought I was crazy for doing it. It was very risky, but I, I found that, that it worked 9.9 .9 times out of 10. Uh, if, if I was, somebody confronted me with a gun after I kicked in their door or, or whatever, or tricked them and let me in, um, I always acted like they didn't have a gun. I just pretended like, I, in fact, I even pretended like I wasn't even there to take them out of their house. I, I go to the fridge, open up a soda, turn on the TV, and just sit down with them, and act like I live there. Wow, and, wow. And the whole time they're pointing a gun at me, and they're, they're going, you have to leave, you have to get out of my house, and I'm like, so, kind of stuff you like to watch on TV, you know, I, I avoided the subject, and it confused the hell out of them. And they were so busy trying to figure out what the hell I was up to that they didn't bother to think of shooting me. So, they forgot what they uh, were up to. Yeah, it, it, it interrupted their train of thought, and, and confusion was, was my best weapon. If I confused them, it was it was it worked out well for them and for me. Because a lot of guys would go into those situations, just charge the guy, beat the shit out of him, you know, tie him up, throw him in the back of the rig, deliver him to the psych facility, say, here he is, he gave us some problems, and, and leave. But I didn't do that. I, I didn't want to hurt anybody. And I had to a lot of times because I just, I mean, I got stabbed twice. So generally, I, I kind of have to act like that happened. Right. <laughs> I can't ignore that. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> that. That leaves one of those lasting memories, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but, but then, then I basically would just turn it into what it was in, in actuality, which was it was basically an arrest. He took these people away from their drugs or alcohol or their weird fantasy world that they're living in, and they tend to get angry, and they'll fight you. And it, it was not uncommon at all to get two, three fights a day in that job. Wow. So there you go, folks. Do not mess with Kelly Garney. He will wrap you up and then confuse you and then bring you to the crazy ward. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. But, you, know, you just learn. You know, luckily, you know, coming from where I came from, you know, uh, street fighting was, was basically what you, you know, participated into. And uh, and that's all it was in, you know, in an ambulance. You had to be a, a, a good street fighter to survive in that job. Uh, very high turnover rate in that job. Mostly people hurting their backs, lifting people. Uh, oh. But I, I managed the last ten years, which is pretty pretty good time. And because um, most people didn't even last a year, some some didn't even last a couple of days. Wow! I imagine that you know, depending on the size of the person you're picking up, that could get you know pretty bad on your back quick. Oh, it was a very common injury. Very common. And, and you know, I went out and. I really hadn't gained any weight or anything since Quiet Riot. I didn't work out. I didn't do anything. When I was at Quiet Riot, I was 5'9 at 106 pounds. Damn. And that's what I hit the streets on an ambulance at, 106 and 5'9. Wow. 
He was a bean pole, I'm telling you. Well, it's like they yeah, say, you know, I was. Um, it's like they say back home, it's not the size of the tiger in the fight, but the size of the fight in that tiger. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing, um, but I, you know, where I came from, most people didn't pull guns on you and a knife here and there, but not. You know, mostly it was a bottle or something, and um, you know, and I had plenty of those thrown at me and everything else. I've had people pick up couches and throw them at me. <laughs> Not just the chair over there. No, the fucking couch. Fucking couch. <laughs> <laughs> You seen that yeah. commercial where they're racing the lazy boys up the freeway? Yeah. <laughs> twice, twice I had couches thrown at me. Twice. Two times? Wow. Two times. Yep. And one was by a guy and one was by a woman. Wow. Wow. How big yeah. was the woman? Oh, she was gigantic. And, uh, and she actually came closest to everybody of actually killing me. Wow. I had her up against a wall, pinned up against a wall, me and my partner, and she... I don't know where she got them, but she pulled out the biggest fucking pair of scissors I ever saw in my life. Wow. Get ready to open up a bridge or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was, I was bent over, you know, putting restraints on her hands and her waist, and she tried to put that pair of scissors right through me. Wow. And luckily my partner got her, and uh, she, she paid a very dear price for it. I was a little bit perturbed over that one. Yeah, I can understand uh, that. And the other time was a big, huge biker guy, and he threw the couch, and he went through a second-story window and landed on the street below. <laughs> That's like a scene out of something. <laughs> <laughs> a sitcom, yeah. Seinfeld. You know, well, that'd be like an outtake from, you know, uh, Big Lebowski. Say what? So that'd be like an outtake from the Big Lebowski. <laughs> yeah. You know, as, as bad as it sounds, oh my God, somebody's throwing a, a couch at me. Well, the upside is, is the couches are pretty easy to avoid getting hit by. Yeah, that's no doubt. Yeah. 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 They're very big. You just jump out of the way. And it's cumbersome <laughs> to get back and try and throw it again. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's the bottles, the books, and, you know, all the other kind of dangerous shit that they throw at you. That, that, that hurts. Yeah. But, yeah, like ashtrays. Uh, Wow. Yeah, the, the couch, no big deal. I, you know, I wouldn't even care if people threw couches at me all day long. <laughs> that could be a workout. <laughs> you know that? Uh, Kelly Garney, yeah, yeah, couch it, dodging. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aerobics with Kelly Garney featuring uh, tossing couches. Yeah. yeah. Well. New Olympic sport, the couch toss. <laughs> Man, that is such a uh, mental image. Some somebody throwing a couch. And, uh, yeah, that, that will stick with me forever, bro. Yeah, it never. It amused me. You know, everybody says. You know, they always ask me, "Oh, that must have been the most stressful job." And I always say, "You know, actually, it was the most relaxing job I ever had in my life." And it's a hundred percent true. I think you said uh, that to me back in the Code Four band room at one time. Yeah, I'm sure I, of it. It was just like you were, first of all, if you went on a call, you were so focused that you didn't have time to be scared. And, and you learn real quick out there, because it is true, you know, uh, fear and hesitation, you know, equals death for you. So you learn not to be afraid, and you learn not to let any of it get to you. And so, you know, you just, just kind of, relax. You relax so that your body almost naturally does it if you can train your brain right. And you just totally chill and you be cool because that's the only way you're going to get out of this situation. If you lose your head, you start thinking wrong, you make the wrong move, you do something way too aggressive at the wrong time, you're going to get hurt. Gotcha. You know, because people that, that are getting taken away from their drugs and alcohol are fucking pissed off. And actually, you know, and actually yeah, crazy too. as fuck about getting to... Well, that, they're about to lose their freedom, too. Yeah. All in one fell swoop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it doesn't work out too well for you if you're not totally on your feet. And then, you know, like, like you're driving down the street, like firing, you know, and you're thinking, you know, okay, you're going through everything in your head. You know, what am I going to do? You're, and all you usually get is something like a car wreck at this and this intersection. That's all you get. And so you're thinking, okay, you have a bunch of what ifs. You go through different medical scenarios in your head. What if the person has this? You know, crushed sternum. 
you know, lacerated liver, you know, you go over all the things in your head, what you're looking for as far as symptoms, you know, head injuries, okay, on my blood pressure, you know, I'm going to have a high uh, systolic over a diastolic, uh, that tells me there's pressure in the brain, you know, you, you're running through all these little things in your head, so that when, once you get there, and, and everybody's looking at you, you know, like, hey, you saved my day, you know what the fuck you're doing. Right. Right. It's all, it's all almost like a reaction at that point. Yeah, just kind of kicks I, in. I found not running calls to be very stressful because then you're just sitting and you're waiting and you don't know what's going to come your way. So I would call, my partners would hate it because we'd get on station and then they'd be going, ah, you know, and then I'd sit back and relax for a little while, generally 30 or 40 minutes, but um, I'd be sitting there on the phone with the dispatcher going, you know, hey, got a call right now? And my partners hated me because I made them work. Pretty yeah. high tempo. Yeah, yeah, but it was. I'm glad I did it. It was uh, one of the jobs I ever did in my life that I'm proud of. I didn't do any military service, so. Yeah, I but figured, you know, from what you you just you know told me, it sounds very similar, you know, to being downrange or, or being in a combat situation, because you're facing yeah. you know that danger every night. You got to be focused, but you can't let it get to you, you know, and. That's whenever I went through the army. Along, with, you know, my buddy that's in there right now, uh, Bustasa. You know, both of us had to go through, you know, boot camp. We were both in the army and everything, and uh, sounds very similar. You know, sounds very similar. Uh -huh. Yeah, you just you just learn to keep your your brain in this in this vein, so to speak, of, of thought, where you know you're going to do the right thing. That's what you're there to do, and you're going to do it. Sometimes you have to do it fast. You, you're in an upside down car. Hanging upside down, you know, you smell gas everywhere. You're on the side of the freeway. All you need is some fuckwad to come by and toss a cigarette. And you're a toast. Mm -hmm. You know, you can so is your people. So you get them out of their fast. You just keep your head. And, you know, it's, and you're soaking gas, you know. And so it's it just, you learn to just be very calm in that job. And I, I actually, if I miss anything about that job, it's, it's the way just my human body reacted to it by always keeping me very calm and level-headed. Now, um, nowadays, do you do anything to kind of relax or meditate? Or anything like that? Uh, smoke weed. Yes! <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't drink anything. Right, so. <laughs> it's always 420 yeah. somewhere in the world. Uh -huh. yeah, no, it, it's relaxing to me. I, I, don't, I don't do it a lot. Very, very little, and um, you know, I didn't like it my whole life. Now, all of a sudden, it, it's, it's a relaxing thing for me. So, uh, since I can't, I, I won't and can't drink anymore because I'm not a good drinker, I'm a horrible drunk, I'm really bad at it. There's just, I lose all self control, I'll say anything, I'll do anything, and I'm just not good at drinking. I'm just not. And plus, for me, at my size and the amount that I can drink is like totally unhealthy. Now, um, while you were doing the, 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 being a paramedic, is that about the same time frame uh, that you were in Code 4? Uh, it, was, it was sort of an in-between time. Uh, when I was in Code 4, which was up in Las Vegas, I moved up to Vegas to work for an ambulance company up here, which I eventually did. But, but in the meantime, I actually found a better job, and that paid like 10 times more, so I did that. And that was when I was in Code 4. And uh, Code 4 was, was a really one of the funner bands that I was ever in because it wasn't about being a rock star. It wasn't about making it. We could have cared less, really, if we made a record. Certainly, it, you know, we, we had thoughts, but... It was about having fun. It was, it was all about having fun. And we had this house that we all lived in, and it became a regular party spot on Friday and Saturday nights. We'd always have a party and play, and it was just really crowded. Tons of girls, tons of people, tons of booze. And just, you know, it was all about just having a great time. And that was a lot of fun for me. Now, tell me, uh, how did Buffy 
figure into this equation? How does she enter the picture with Code 4? I I'm curious. Uh -oh. Well, she, um, I, I, if I recall, she attended one of our parties and uh, was likely to happen to any girl available that walked into one of our parties. She, she hooked up with a member of our band, specifically uh, one of the guitar players. <laughs> Here comes the skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it, it, to be honest, it was, it was mostly his house, and and he was an okay guy. He got a little odd in the end, but um, he was an okay guy. And the two of them were the big item, you know. And she moved in with him, and we all lived there. So basically, I lived with Buffy, and um, she was basically sort of a part of our band. She was she was every bit as important to all of us as any other member was. Now, she's told me a story about this wild-ass cat. Fill me in on this wild-ass cat that y'all had. Uh, I remember only a few things about the cat. I know it wasn't my cat, because I'm not a cat guy, I'm a dog guy. And so, yeah, there was a crazy cat around there. And It was mine. <laughs> oh, it was yours? Yes. Oh, okay. The white cat that used to... The cat it was. Oh, all right. Yeah, it was her cat. <laughs> 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 you know, it's not like a dog, you know, it's pretty, you know, dog. Remember the cop showing up there at one of the parties that got out of hand? Who? The cop showing up there at one of the parties that got out of hand? Remember oh, the people would come time, from that 7-Eleven out there on Smoke Ranch and Jones because they'd hear the music and come over to that little Sir Lancelot circle there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh... Hey. They came by pretty regularly. Yeah, it was crazy because me, me and Chuck would constantly be going outside trying to talk sense to the cops, and there'd be people out in the front yard. Sometimes they'd be shooting guns. <laughs> 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 me and Chuck Patterson were all bombed up trying to t make some sense of this and not go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if you're a musician and you grow up in rock bands and you play in rock bands, loud rock bands, and, you know, you have the whole defiant attitude thing going for you, you know, you're, you're definitely going to start being on a first-name basis with a lot of cops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had any be bad to be, you know, other than shut it down or turn it down. Or no, we never did. Yeah. We never did. So, no, we were kind of out there in the desert. We weren't really causing too much commotion, so um, the cops just said, well, at least all the, you know, all the degenerates are in one place, and, <laughs> and that was cool with them, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, never um, no trouble, but they did have to come out to the call and make the report. <laughs> and you're out there trying to make sense to them. Oh, and I was stoned. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> 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 that band was a lot of fun. It, um, you know, it, it, the, all the guys that were in it were great guys, and they were really cool. We were all really good friends, and you know, it wasn't the greatest band in, in the world, but we were had a good time for Las Vegas. There were hardly any rock bands here, and there was only like two places in the whole town to play, and um, generally they didn't hire bands like ours. So we just did it for fun, and it was great. Yeah, what people don't understand, you know, back then in that time frame, uh, Vegas was more, you know, big shows, uh, things that were playing on the strip, not really, you know, about which the population. Well, it wouldn't be about the like the underground rock bands or anything like that. You know, the garage bands that were right. coming up. They didn't. It, it wasn't based around that at that time. Yeah, well, it, it, there was no music scene like 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 there is now, starting to really really thrive here in Las Vegas. I mean, now you have a lot of rock stars that live up here. You can go to any club and rub shoulders with them. Okay, so, you know, it's not Axel or somebody or Slash hanging out there, but uh, I got like uh, Frank Domino, singer from Angel lives up here. I'm always running into him. Uh, a couple guys from Striper uh, live up here. I've, I've done a couple shows with those guys. Really nice guys. Paul Shore 
Filipino who was in Quiet Riot for just a few minutes there. Um, you know, these are these are the kind of people that, that you have moving up here. Um, and, and there's probably some real big rock stars that live up around here. My good friend, Todd Kearns, who's in uh, Slash's uh, project now, uh, was with a local band here called the Sin City Sinners. Mm-hmm. And, and Todd is just, uh, man, I can't say enough good things about that guy. I've never really idolized too many bass players in my life, but he is definitely one I do idolize. That guy is unbelievably great. He's a great front man. He, he, I mean, he sings like three songs in um, Slash's thing. You know, and, and they got that Miles Kennedy guy up there. Well, ain't no slouch. Wow. And uh, but they still let Todd sing three songs. You know, which which said a lot for for Slash and and Miles certainly uh, for not having the kind of huge egos where something like that would never happen. You know, it, it's pretty rare for the bass player to get up there and, and sing lead in three songs. You know, and it's as big as yeah, Slash. I have heard that about Miles. That uh, he's very you know laid back, no ego knows where he came from very you know well grounded yeah that's pretty cool I've, I've never met uh miles i've never met slash i'd love to meet slash i read his book and i really enjoyed it there's uh, about 15 guys here in town that all look like slash but you can probably say that <laughs> just about any town yeah you can find but, elvis um, you know on every street corner <laughs> pretty much <laughs> yeah that, that's the other thing too vegas has become very rock and roll like if you go down to the fremont street as it's called now. There's there's a lot of impersonators down there that, that are, you know, uh, basically posing for pictures with tourists, but, you know, they're getting a buck here, a buck there, five bucks here, whatever. End of the night, you know, they, they got a pretty good night going for them, and, and there's guys down there in full kiss regalia. There's uh, definitely a slash guy. There's a kid rock guy. Well, there's two of those. And uh, there might even be more than four kiss guys all i know is that i see them everywhere and more power to them you know and the de demographics of the people that are visiting vegas now it's not so much the people that are going to come here and go see celine dion or certainly the days of sinatra and and on up to like barbara streisand and and you know the those kind of days in Vegas, they still exist, but they exist pretty much predominantly on the Strip. But you get outside the Strip, and you're, you're going to see some some cool people. A lot of cool bands play up here in very, very small clubs, and, and the people in those bands are very uh, accessible. My band, we played a club called uh, Two Clubs that we normally play a lot in. One is the Underworld, which is run, run by some very good friends of mine. And... Um, They've had some great acts in there, big acts. And then there's another club called Vamps. And uh, they got, you know, they'll have like Michael Schenker in there. And um, let's see, who else played there that was big that I saw? Oh, uh, Jack Russell. With Jack Russell's great, right? White or whatever. I went and saw him there. I don't, I don't go out and see too many bands. So I, I rehearse all week and then if I do a show on a Friday or Saturday, that, that's enough rock and roll for me. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's with rehearsals all week, you know, and then, you know, after, after that, it's like, okay, 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 I have to do all this. So, um, music is more of a business to me now. And I still love to play, I love performing, I love recording. Uh, I even like rehearsing, but, um, you know, the, in my band, I'm sort of a, a manager kind of a thing. Me and Tommy Ray Brown, we, we basically, her and I call the shots, but I mean, our current band, I've had to fire nine people out of it. Wow. I finally got the right lineup, you know, and, and that, that makes you enemies every time. So, um, that's, you know, just stuff like that, that by the end of the week, it's like, oh, I don't want to go see somebody play, you know, it's like, I don't want to be around the clubs, and, and plus with not drinking, I really can't have any fun anymore anyway, so, I'm just not that into it, but, You're on his tricks in Cali. Yeah. Well, there's, right there's, I mean, there, there's no less than 25 or 30 good bars and clubs for bands to play in here. And there was a time, like I said, when there was only two. And guys are making a living now. I'm making a living. Play. And and 
It's been a long time coming to Vegas. I remember you telling me that. Uncommon in music to actually get paid uh, to play. It used to be the other way around. You pay to play. And although there is some of that starting to seep into Vegas, I'm hoping the club owners don't make that a matter of policy because they shoot themselves in the foot. I, I, I realize their side of the story that they have to fill a house, they have to sell X amount of drinks to, uh, you know, cut their nut. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, but pay to play gonna, really sucks, man. It really does. Yeah, bands are going to come in there and say, oh, we have a huge following, and, and all these people are going to show up with, like, you know, 9 million people on our Facebook page and all this. And then they do a show, you know, and their girlfriend show up, and maybe their mom and dad, and that's yeah. it, you know. And the club's going, where's the 1 million people that we're supposed to show, you know? And I don't know. You know? And it is. You know, and you can say, well, they must be over at this club or that club seeing so-and-so. Um, yeah, there's only like two in town, right? <laughs> well, at yeah. that time. Yeah. What was so, one of them, the Moby Grape? Yeah, that's all I'm going. Yeah. Wow, that and was a fun place, though. The Troubadour was the other good club they had back then, and that's yeah. now uh, Cheetah's Topless Bar. Although, if you give the girl enough money, it's not so topless anymore. <laughs> 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 you just moved to a different room. <laughs> now, um, I still have a lot of friends from uh, you know when we were living in Vegas, or when I was living in Vegas, and uh, they always complain to me about you know the pay to play and how it's bullshit because it's been like that for you know quite a number of years on the strip. If you want to play the whiskey, well, here's 50 tickets, go sell them. Yeah. And yeah, the scene. We don't, we don't have that here. You know, the scene nowadays, you know, um, I went and watched a friend of mine's band down there at the Whiskey, and, uh, you know, at the Strip out there, it was it was a Friday night, mm -hmm. and there was no one out there on Sunset Strip. Yeah. I mean, well, not Sunset like it Strip used is, to be. Yeah, those days are gone. It, it had its day. Somebody will probably revitalize it somehow. There'll be some sort of a... Uh, cultural movement that will make the Sunset Strip cool again, but the way it is now, compared to what it was, I mean, it, it's a rather sad place. Um, I, I went and played the whiskey a few times in recent years, and, and if, if you were to ask me to play at the whiskey now, I'd say, fuck no, I don't want to play in that dump. That, that's exactly what I say. And to me, it is. It is a dump. I don't like it there anymore. Uh, if you're a band, I mean, generally bars will give the bands at least free drinks. Um, that's always that was always the case in LA, and it was always the case in Vegas. So that's what anybody would be used to coming from where I am. But now it's like the last time I played there. Last couple times, you know, it's like, oh, I'll have a beer, you know, when I when I drink. You know, okay, that's seven dollars. You know, what the fuck? You know, yeah. I'm playing here for free, and I gotta buy my own beer. You know, so I just, I just don't think that whole. It's not like it was. It, it's, it's one thing to be from somewhere else and go there. Yeah, you'll think it's the rock capital of the world, but the reality is that street ain't churning out the bands like it used to. No, I mean you still got you know some of your your regular hang arounds like the rainbow you know Lemmy's got his own sp special place in there and he's the only one that's allowed to smoke and you know things like that but it's it's not what I've seen back in the day you know or read about back in the all day. the black spandex and spikes were cruising up you might bump into Motley Crue trying to get over to Gazaris from the rainbow or I mean it was crazy in the 80s sometimes yeah, yeah it just it, it's uh Jaded wouldn't be the right word for it. It's, it's more like the place kind of burned itself out. As yeah. In the 80s. I mean, all the dudes and bands in the 80s and all the bands and everything, I mean, they did trash Sunset pretty well. And Sunset was used to it. I mean, in the 60s, you know, they had riots and everything. It was always a magnet for some sort of problems. But uh, that street, you know, gave birth to so many bands in the alleys and the trenches and in the gutters uh, that it almost tapped out all the talent out of that town. It would seem because um, you could still go there and see some good bands, but you, you're going to go to somewhere like the Rainbow, you're going to go to the Key Club, you're going to go to the Whiskey. You know, I think the Country Club or something is still open out there. That was a great club, but um, that was in the Valley. Um, but um, it's just not about like it was. It, it's like back then you went to the Sunset Strip to see music and to see bands. Now, 
Now, um, talking about Vegas, um, what was that record label or uh, that music store you used to hang out at, babe? I don't remember. The Vesley. Oh, Vesley, the the guitar store. Yeah, and you would see all yeah. kind of people there, right? Back in the day. Oh well. Yeah, I, I worked in a music store for a while, and I was a musician at the time, so it was very convenient because I got everything half price, and um, and it was it was a job I could do, and I wouldn't do it again because if there's one thing I learned by working in a music store, uh, that is that you end up hating musicians. And um, they don't come in there and they'll want to buy a pick, okay? What kind do you want? Well, let me try one of those. You know, and you give them the pick and they sit there and they feel it in their fingers. No, that won't work. You got one a little thicker. Okay, try this one. No, that won't work. And you're standing there for like a half an hour while this pick picks up. Fucking pick. <laughs> Buffy told me even, um, who was it? Mark Slaughter? Mark Slaughter got hired right out of there back in the day. Wow. Vinnie Vincent walked in and hired him. And he was working yeah. in Vesley. Did you go on the Vesley bus to see Vinnie Vincent open for Iron Maiden at the Los Angeles Coliseum? Were you there with us all? Uh, no. Oh, what a crazy time, man. They actually had a Vesley bus? Yeah, we rent, We all chipped in and rented a bus to go see Mark Slaughter open for Iron Maiden. Oh, that's pretty cool. And we got cool. to go on Mark Slaughter's tour bus. It was a grand time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I played in a band uh, up in Vegas, which is where Mark, Mark's from. But he had, uh, other than Code Forest, the other hot band in town was a band called Excursion. Very cleverly expelled with an X. Excursion, uh, yes. And uh, that was a three-piece with Mark and a drummer by the name of Anthony Balatoni, who was in uh, Vicious Rumors. Okay. And um, it was just the three of us. And Mark played lead guitar and sang lead, and Anthony, the drummer, sang backup. And he, they were both great singers, and Mark was actually a really good guitar player. And it was a cool band. And uh, he, you know, was like one of the few people that eventually did make it uh, out of Las Vegas and hit kind of, you know, what you'd call big time, although that sure didn't last very long, but uh, that could be said about a lot of bands. It could even be said about Quiet Riot if you want to, but uh, they say it to me, so I guess it must be true. But, I uh, actually remember him saying that when Vinnie Vincent kind of hired him, it was for his singing and not for his guitar playing and uh, it was kind of bumming him out because he was truly a guitar player. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. And, and that worked out well for him because Mark was able to spin it off into his own little thing. And yeah, he did. He had a couple of really good hits, you know, Up All Night, yeah. you know, Fight of the Angels. These are all great, good rock songs that deserve to be hits. And, um, you know, but that was pretty much the extent of, of their their whole thing. Mark, Mark was a, a good guy to play with. He's a nice guy. Uh, Anthony, I've not heard of him in a zillion years. And, um, you know, so, but, but for, for Las Vegas, Mark was sort of a rarity. He's really, quite honestly, the first rock and roll guy to ever grow up in Las Vegas, go to school here, play in bands here, and then actually make it. Although yeah. he had to do it out of L.A. Now, you know, you mentioned the Sin City Centers earlier, and uh, they used to play pretty regularly over at uh, Boulder Station Casino, right? Where now? Was it Boulder Station? Yeah, Boulder Station. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot, all the hotels up here have, uh, most, of the, most of the hotels uh, have a showroom where they'll have rock and roll. And um, a lot of your 80s bands, uh, and I'm not just talking metal, you know, here either. I mean, you'll see, you know, Leonard Skinner, you know, at, at uh, Sunset Station or at Rio or something or New Orleans. And you'll see all these 80s bands playing. Quiet Riot plays up here all the time. Uh, 
you know, all these uh, bands um, are playing these showrooms and they're making good money. They're free to get into. Not one of them charges you, but they do make it up on the drinks. I went and saw a band a couple weeks ago, ordered a bottle of water. Okay, I didn't have to pay to get in, but a bottle of water was three dollars. Wow. So that's where they make their money, you know. So okay, that's fine. That's part of the deal. Fine. You know, I just won't drink that much water. And um, you know, when I can get a twenty-four pack of water bottles for three dollars, you know. Uh, but that that's how they're they're making their their ends meet in these little uh, sort of showrooms, and pretty much every hotel has one. Now, um, after Code 4, um, what were you into at that time? What were you doing? Uh, I think after Code 4, I went back to California, uh, ended up working some ambulance again, uh, went on to, I met a girl, and she had a little bit of money. We wisely invested in a business, and this new business that was just emerging in the uh, late 80s uh, called a video store and you could actually play a music in this or a, a movie in these machines that were like $900 and they were called VCRs and and you rented these movies for $5 and, and you know you stood in a line because there were so many customers and we had a little bit of money and we invested in a store like that and within a year I was a multi-millionaire wow yeah. Which is, of course, all gone now, but <laughs> I had a good time. Oh, um. And after that was done, I went back to Ambulance again, which I did that for a few years down there. And then I ended up uh, coming back to Vegas and working Ambulance up here again. And, um, and then eventually I became a, a photographer. And I did that for almost the last 18 years. Now, I took a look at uh, some of your work when you know when we were living in Vegas. I went and took a look. At the, you were doing wedding photography and other types of photography at the same time, correct? Yeah, I did. I did everything. I did uh, models. Um, anybody who's been to Vegas knows that there's nine gazillion hookers here, and uh, they were great as far as the clientele. Uh, there, there's various websites they can upload pictures up to where prospective customers go to kind of shop around for, you know, somewhere to get a nut. And, uh, <laughs> a the, better, the better the pictures of the girl, you know, the more likely she is to get, you know, chosen for the night. And um, uh, so I had a very, very lucrative part of my business was the hookers. And they were great customers, very interesting people. Always paid in cash, nice tips. Sometimes it was even money, and um, you know, it was, you know, I just, I just really had a great time uh, doing photography. I did weddings as well, models, headshots, events. You name it. I, I, I didn't turn down any job, and um, I did very, very, very well for many, many years. And then digital happened, and completely wiped out that industry. But uh, all of a sudden, I was pretty much replaced by a cell phone, and. Uh, uh, that was it. It was all over. I had to find something else to do. So I basically um, turned back into a musician. I just went back to what I knew. And saw all these guys making a living at these little bars and getting free food, free drinks all night. And I said, that's for me. And yeah, you might play, you know, three hours and only make 60 or 70 bucks. But you do that four or five nights a week, you know, and as long as you're not living in a mansion, you'll get by just fine. It's all cash, too. Now, I hear, uh, I hear tell that someone gave you a special birthday present that you still have. Oh, it's a Christmas present? Okay, a special Christmas present. That's forever attached to your arm. Oh, yes, my first tattoo. Yes, uh, Buffy took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she, she's got a, a few tattoos herself. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> yeah, some, some that, that you have to know her really well to see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
really, really well. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, you know, it's got to so she took care of that for a Christmas present. Well, yeah, that was my first, first tattoo. Now i got a whole ton of them, but uh, that, that one is still there. Yeah, I keep saying one of these days I'm going to catch up with how many, how many you got, Buff? I lost count at 40 some years ago. I just quit keeping count. I haven't kept count. I know. She is a, a walking billboard, but yeah, you can't see most of them. <laughs> Strategically Still played. likes to get them there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah, see it. Yeah. <laughs> Right on, brother. Now, um, for a while, uh, whenever you know me and you first met, um, you were jamming in a band called Alistair Wild. Yeah, that was a little quicky thing, little thing that I did with with uh, Randy's brother Kelly Rose, and uh, branched off into uh, another band. Uh, it was out of Ohio, and he's on the West Coast in Burbank, and and I'm here in, in Nevada. And we've gone back there to do a tribute show for the, the troops. It was the first one we ever did, and and we we never honestly we've never been asked before. But these guys actually asked me and him to go back there and, and do this show. And so we said, well, sounds like a pre vacation to us. So we went and we had such a good time. We said we have to keep this going and do it all the time. So we we did end up playing with with the band that we played with and. Um, that all only lasted about a year, but it branched off into another project uh, with uh, Wayne Finley from Michael Shanker's group, the guitar player and keyboard player in that, uh, the drummer from Pete Ways Wasted, Scotty Phillips, and um, Kelly was playing keyboards, he didn't have to sing anymore, we had a singer whose name I don't even remember, but we ended up cutting it out, and the band was called No Sky Today, and we put out one hell of a killer album. I mean, just really great metal stuff. And, um, but then me and Kelly were sort of a, well, I had the drummer, we were kind of asked to leave the band. We hadn't even done anything. And, um, I think what it was is one of the members, uh, who was younger than us had a vision of a younger looking band. And I think we were age discriminated against and the old men were shown the door and <laughs> told to get lost. And that's what we did. And, you know, now the current band that I'm in, it's a good thing to be an old man. You have to be to, to remember the songs that we do. So, um, you know, I'm a lot happier now playing. I don't have to get all beat up playing metal. I love metal. I listen to it a lot. But playing it, I just can't. I can't deliver to the fans the way I used to. I can't get all crazy. I can't bleed all over my face. You know, I can't break things on stage anymore. And it's just not me. And so this band, I just kind of lay back in the groove and just be cool, you know, and keep it all together. I've done a lot of James Brown tunes, Janis Joplin, Anna James, uh, stuff people would never think that I would do. But this, this is actually where Mrs. Rhodes and her training uh, came into play as far as um, me being able to walk into pretty much any situation and um, uh, be able to do that kind of music. So, uh, you know, I might as well be black. That's the way I play now. Right on. And, uh, you yeah. know, me and Buffy both are, are fans, believe it or not, of, you know, Motown and R&B. And uh, when we first moved out here to Alabama um, a year and a half ago, um, my friend took me to, uh, it was a country, uh, kind of, it's like a bar slash a theater kind of a place, huge stage, there's big name country acts that come through there, but they were doing this area that we live in, it's called the Wiregrass area, why, I have no idea, kind of grass, but they were doing a Wiregrass, uh, mu annual musician's convention and we had like 500 musicians there and you know we could get up and jam with whoever hey, Bobby, Bobby. Uh -huh. hey, can you hold on one second sure man I'm sorry I'm so, in fact why don't you play one of those old quiet riot songs for everybody while we're doing it because uh, I have a, a different phone ringing 
I sure will. You go ahead and I'll take care of what you got to take care of. I'm going to go ahead and roll with both of those tunes, and uh, we'll be back in like seven minutes. Yeah, let them hear the fucking Eskimo song. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, you heard that. He's gonna. Uh, he's got to step out for a minute, but we're gonna sit here and listen to some quiet rights. So stick around, fuckers. Here it comes right in your eye. We are back live. Hello. And you're listening to Brutal Metal Radio, and this is the Bullshit with Bob show. Got Buffy here with me on my side, and we're talking to Mr. Kelly Garney. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Now we were talking through the break. You know about your band, um, the Godmother of Soul, and uh, uh-huh. I know you guys are playing shows right now. Are you planning on, you know, recording an album and, you know, taking the show on the road? Well, on the road, definitely. Uh, as far as an album, uh, the big thing where everybody's making a buck these days is is cover bands doing other people's music, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're doing jazz Joplin songs, we're doing James Brown songs, all that kind of stuff. And making an album of it would almost be sort of redundant, but we did actually record one, and it'll be for sale in our merchandising uh, end of things. Uh, but, but again, I go back to, you know, if you want to make money in this business, you're going to have to earn it. So we have a, a, a really good promoter uh, at uh, uh, Zirconia. Uh, I think they're Zirconia Music, they're called. And he books bands like ours, Tribute Acts, we're known as. Um, he books us worldwide. So we'll be, you know, going all over the world, certainly all over the country. And, you know, yeah, you're playing stuff like in India, uh, in the Indian casino, like in Tampa or something. Um, that's perfectly fine, actually. You know, they pay very well. They treat you good. And... Um, you know, everything's taken care of for you, so, um, it's just an easier route for a band like ours to go, but definitely we'll be touring all over the place, all over the world. Oh, and, and by the way, just to let you guys in the chat room out there in listener land, the two songs you heard by Quiet Riot was Quinn the Eskimo and Afterglow of Your Love. Now that song I like. That was a, that was a cool song, and I always loved singing it on stage with Kevin. I see what you mean about Quinn the Eskimo. That's an old 70s tune, ain't it? Well, yeah. But that's what they wanted us to play, so... Yeah, I mean, that's what they wanted us to play, so... Back then, you know, covering other bands was sort of a a gray area. Not a lot of bands did it. It was all about original material. In fact, back then, if you were a band and you only played other people's songs, you couldn't play anywhere. Um, these days you can do that and play everywhere, so it's really turned around quite a bit. Um, but, um, boy, I got admonished uh, recently for saying um too much. Uh, they, uh, that was an odd, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of bands out there now that, that are making a living doing tribute things. You'll find full on kiss tributes, you know, there's, and they come up with, with really catchy titles. Uh, Motley Crue seems to have at least three or four uh, tribute bands in this town, and and a thing like uh, most, they play with the name, they'll, they'll write the same letters as Motley Crue, and instead they're not called Motley Crue, they're called Mostly True, you know, or something like that. Um, so, but back, back when I was growing up, bands like that would get booked for anything in a million years. Now you can get booked all over the world doing that kind of stuff, which is really interesting. Talking about tributes, you know, my favorite tribute band of, of all, of any tribute band out there, is Mini Kiss. <laughs> Those yeah. guys fucking rule, man. They're, they're a bunch of midgets. They dress up like Kiss, they get out there, they fucking throw down. Well, they must be from Vegas, because uh, I have actually seen pictures of that, and that's the general idea, only taller. Because um, you've got, uh, I'm trying to think now. Well, I don't even I don't even have to tell anybody that pretty much every town in the whole world has their local Ozzy tribute town. You have a, a guy that looks like Ozzy, you have a guy that, that kinda of looks like Randy, and you know the bass player doesn't really matter because there's been so many in and out of there and same with the drummer. So as long as you got a Randy guy and, and a 
Now, um, also before the break, I was leading into uh, you know this convention we had out here, and uh, you know we had like 500 musicians there, and you can go up on stage and just jam with whoever you know if you know a song, get there and jam. And there was this guy, um, he sang back up, you know he was signed to Motown, and he sang back up for a band. I think it was the Platters, and. Uh, the guy, I mean, he looks like a pit bull. You know, he was a African American. He looked like a pit bull, and he come come up to you, and you know, he met everybody, came up to everybody, and shook their hand, introduced himself. Hi, how you doing? I'm a musician. And they got up there, and they fucking threw down. They did some old school Motown, bro. And I'm telling you, they threw the fuck down on that shit. I was very impressed. Yeah. Well, that the, you know, music is, is a uh, a medium that that often throughout time has come around full circle. Quite frankly, you know, the, the 90s weren't known for making really great music, uh, neither were the 2000s, and, you know, the, the 2010s are, like, not that great either. You have a lot of musical confusion right now as far as it, and basically every band, uh, any entertainer in this business right now, is all wondering the same thing. What's the next big, big thing? Because whatever it is, I'm going to start playing it right fucking now. Yeah, right. But nobody knows. Nobody knows what the next big thing is. So what what your audience has to do, your bands and, and things like that, is they tend to gravitate towards what they know. So we got 10,000 bands out there doing Motley Crue covers and Kiss guys with makeup and, you know, and, and not only that, some, for some of these bands, t ticket prices are just uh, on, on this planet. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, particularly here in Vegas, seeing, you know, the shittiest seat to go see, like, a KISS concert is, like, you know, a thousand dollars or something. And no one can afford this, but everybody can walk into a bar for free, order up a beer for a couple bucks, you know, and see a band, you know, basically imitating them. And with without any new stuff coming out, um, you know, there's really nothing for people to listen to. I mean, I see a lot of people try. There's, there's a lot of people that are current that I really dig that most people wouldn't think I would. Like, I'm a huge Lady Gaga fan. And I'm sure I just made almost all of your listeners throw up. <laughs> I, think, I think she puts on a really good show. I love her attitude. And, you know, she's got a fuck you attitude. And, and okay, that, that kind of shit I noticed. She's got a, a really cool stage show. You know, obviously a lot of time and effort was put into learning all that dancing and everything that's going on with all those dancers. I can't even imagine putting all that together. I oh, know, right? And that's huge. Yeah. So she's she's got my respect, you know, and um you know, plus I, I actually like a couple of her songs. Some some I don't like, but, but some of them are cool. You know, the the rap thing and all that that's going down that all the, you know, headbangers hate. Um really I'm no expert on the subject, so if I sound like an idiot, you were forewarned, but uh, <laughs> rap stuff is very cultural, and, um, you know, but, but, and a lot of people aren't open enough, open-minded enough to give it a listen and to try to understand it, well, I heard a couple of rap things, and I said, what, what's the deal with this, and so I listened to it, and I went, oh, well, I hear a lot more in there than other people are hearing. You know, you got African Americans and who dominate uh, that genre of music. You know, and you can really kind of feel their roots in the rhythm that that go on in rap music. Uh, rap musicians are often not even considered musicians. In fact, they're looked down upon as people that don't have any talent. But quite frankly, I think some of the things they do are very clever. And if ever there was a genre of music that can exploit technology, it's that one. And so, that being what you have to work with, um, a lot of that stuff is kind of cool. There's some great singers out there that are putting out stuff. It's just not really, none of it has been enough to cause like a cultural movement like the 80s music did. I mean, that spawned a whole generation of people wearing black leather and spikes. You know, the 50s, everybody was wearing letterman's jackets and body socks or something, or letters on their dress, I don't fucking know. But um, the 60s, you had to be a hippie, you know, and uh, the 90s was more of a disco thing, you know, and more electronica and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and virtually all these um, decades, you had something specific happen within a 10-year space, and we're like two decades overdue for something new. 
right. It's just like I said, nobody knows what that new thing is that everybody's going to just go totally bananas over. It ain't going to be fucking Justin Bieber, who, for the record, I think is a total, total pussy. And <laughs> I, I don't get it, but I'm not a 12 year old girl. And if Justin Bieber has something redeeming for me, I have no clue what it is. And we uh, here at Beautiful but, Metal Radio agree with you 120 fucking yeah. percent. Uh, about the only thing I can identify with is some little girl that was sick died the other day and she was referred to as Mrs. Beaver because they had this mock wedding and she stood next to a poster and got married to Justin Beaver. All right. Well, that's cool. Well, where was the motherfucker when she was standing there next to the wall? I mean, why is he standing next to her? A fucking poster. You gotta be kidding me. You know, his publicity people dropped the ball on that one and I'm sure that they were contacted. You know, oh, come down, you know. But I bet you now he's kicking himself in the ass. Oh, man, I should have showed up and married that little girl, even if she was six years old and gonna die. You know, it would have made her day. And now look at all the publicity she's getting, you know. And, but it, musically, I don't, what I have heard, which I couldn't even tell you what it was. I could not name one song he does. I don't like the way the kid looks, you know. If I saw him in school, I'd beat him up myself. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's been yeah, nothing lunch. there's been nothing in the new uh, the new millennium that has defined the generations like that used to be like you said you know there's in the 90s there was you know the grunge thing in the 80s of course it was metal in the 70s it was more of your your progressive you know like Rush and, and Queen and things like that that kind of define it Black Sabbath you know and and all this stuff but from 2000 on it's all been bullshit. Right. Well. The only thing that, to me, indicates it could be big, could be, and it's a stretch, but it, it would be a valid type of music uh, to actually get somewhere, because I, I truly feel it deserves it, and that would be a lot of the death metal coming out of, uh, you know, the, the Norway, Sweden, and, you know, Germany, a lot of, you know, that whole part of Europe that's churning out bands like, uh, you know, Nightwish, which is my all-time favorite. Uh, oh, those guys Camelot. are awesome. Yeah, Camelot. Uh, you know, uh, even even that one band with a very, very, very dubious name that would not lend itself to a band with, uh, with talent, but they're actually extremely talented, and that's Cradle of Film. What kind of a name is that for a band? A Cradle of Film. That's the name of our band. Okay. You know, I can just see, you know, people, how do you tell your grandma that's the name of your band? And, but you listen to those guys, and they're ultra talented. They have an ultra great image. They have unbelievably cool shows. Uh, you see these people, like, particularly Nightwish, you know, and Camelot, just have these huge, huge, huge productions. And is there anybody in America doing it? No. Not there's anymore, no. Let's try it. There's a few guys trying, and can you know what a lot of it is? It's the lack of keyboards. Keyboards in America has always been the hardest position to fill in any band, especially a rock band. For, for one thing, keyboard players can work as much as they want. And they all have, they all know it. And so they have a tendency to be like, well, I'm going to go play this music over here because I know I'm going to get paid every night. And you guys, you guys are just doing this stuff that nobody ever really heard and it's, it's good but you know I don't think you have an audience and so I'm not going to stick it out with you so I guess the only thing I can think of is is that in, in Europe and uh, you know uh, Norway, Sweden and, and all those countries in there Finland, Holland um, I'm, I, I kind of get the impression that those kids, those guys in those bands, they grew up with very strictly enforced uh, piano lessons because they get these awesome keyboard players that can do just about anything and that they seem to have a very very strong and cognizant grasp on classical music and they integrate that into this very unique sound that they're producing over there and generally they put a chick up there to sing it there's, there's, but there's guys too of course you know it's about equal but there's some Badass metal chicks coming out of that region, and and they're kicking ass on what guys around here are just starting to do in their garages, and they're way ahead of us in that. And because of everything that they.
way of going for them. The music, the, the technical difficulty of it, the, the image, everything. They got it all down pat. That's the only genre I've seen that's really strong as far as changing the face of rock and roll right now. And I'd be glad to see it happen. But, because um, they, they deserve it. There's some very, very, very talented people in those bands, and they know their classical shit. And if Randy were around today and you heard those guys play it, you'd go, this is what I always wanted to sound like. Those guys. But we had never heard anything like that when we were kids. All we heard was Alice Cooper, David Bowie. We didn't hear, you know, Cradle Phil, the Opeth, you know, Nightwish, you know, those, those bands that just have that huge, huge keyboard sound that this one guy making whole orchestras behind your heavy metal music. And that's where, that's where the secret lies, is in that keyboard player. So if you ever get a good keyboard player in your band, or if you're thinking of doing something to be in a band, learning something, learn fucking keyboards. And don't care about the money. You know, learn, learn a way to find uh, it within yourself to say, I just want to do this for the music. Because keyboards are, like I said, the hardest position to fill in the band. I go through hell if you're trying to find keyboard players. And it's only because they can work these casinos. Hell, a guy can go out there with one keyboard, and if he can sing, he can work in a lounge in a hotel, and play all night, get free drinks, get something free to eat. And at the end of the night, they're going to give this guy 500 bucks. One guy. Because he can put two drums off his keyboards. He can do horn sections. And he can do guitar on his keyboards, a bass. Everything's in there. One man down. A lounge and lizard they, act. Yeah. They have to make a lot of money. <laughs> And, and so, you know, these guys take up keyboards, they learn how to do a few things, and they go run right to where the money is. And so, you know, I think it's because they just don't have that classical music uh, forced down their throat like they most likely do in Europe. That's the only explanation I can think of. Now, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the book that you're, uh, is it, it's already written, correct? Yeah, it's done. It's, it's going to be out in about 30 days. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'm looking forward to reading that. What's the name uh, of it? Say what? What's the name of it? What? Oh, my book? Yeah. yeah. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my book is called Angels with Dirty Faces, and the title is very appropriate because uh, Freddy is often portrayed as, as this very angelic guy uh, who did nothing wrong and was a perfect angel all through his life and that's true in many respects um, but on the other hand we were pretty normal and if you're normal you're not going to be squeaky clean and we weren't so you know I could have really gone out and done a, a job on his whole image and just totally thrown it in the toilet but I didn't want to do that uh, I wanted to just simply tell people the way was in, in such a way that, you know, I didn't trample all over his legacy. Because, I mean, I, there's still, I, I go to his grave once a year, and I, I get these fans that show up. There's usually, on his, the anniversary of his death, there can be anywhere from 100 to 500 people at his grave. And I go down every year, out of 30 years, we just had the 30th anniversary, out of 30 years I've been there 27 times. Uh, one year I was sick, one, one year I had a uh, $3,000 job on that day for about four hours of work, and uh, the other time I was in Japan actually over there doing tribute shows during his anniversary. So in all those years I've only missed three times. but. Um, People that show up is really a, a, a huge cross section of people, but one thing that's quite striking is that I don't have like well, what's left of a hot 80s girl, um, you know, 20 something years later, uh, and she doesn't look like she did in the 80s anymore. Now she's got a husband and a kid, and you know, a couple kids, whatever. And, and they'll show up with this little kid that tries to look like Randy and, and, and worships Randy. And the kid's like, you know, 12 or 13. And, and she's throwing up her hands going, you know, I don't get it. He likes the same kind of music I used to listen to. So for those kind of fans, you know, I had to be 
very careful. You know, I can't encourage them to go out and control bottles at gay hustlers on Selma Street. <laughs> We're going to have to wrap this up. I've got another DJ waiting to pop on. Okay. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Everybody, you know, coming to chat. Thank everybody, too. Yeah, no, it's uh, great, great to be talking bullshit with <laughs> both of you. Oh, and yeah. I had a great time on your show. Well, I appreciate it, Kelly. And, uh, you know, we always love hearing from you, man. We always do. We're always worrying, you know. About how you doing and stuff like that. I know Buffy always, man, I wonder what he's up to. And said, well, fuck, call him. You know? <laughs> yeah, I will. We seem to keep in touch all the time anyhow. Right on, brother. Well, uh, stick, yeah. stick on the phone for a second for me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up the show real quick. And before I do, though, I want to say that today, fellow bass player Cliff Burton died 26 uh, years ago. And. As a tribute, we're going to play Anesthesia Pulling Teeth. We're going to have a moment of noise. So, thank you guys for tuning in. This has been Brutal Metal Radio, Bullshit with Bob and Buffy and Hi, Kelly, Garney. Kelly Garney. And uh, stick around, folks. Got DJ Deadboy coming up to throw it on you after this. <laughs> 